Hello everyone, this is an IB physics past paper review and this is from the, the paper from May 2018, uh, standard level paper one, and this is page seven where we look at question 12. So we have a sealed cylinder, okay, and there's a length L and a cross-sectional area A that contains a number of molecules N, capital N, um, of an ideal gas at a temperature T. So everything's constant there, and we are dealing with an ideal gas. So probably worth just having in the back of our minds again this, um, I'll put it down at the bottom here, this part of our data sheet here, uh, ideal gas. So very likely we're going to need PV and RT. Okay, uh, we're asked to find the force acting on the area of the cylinder, marked A, due to the gas. So this is where we model our gas as being the sort of kinetic model in that uh, all of the particles or the molecules inside, the, inside this cylinder are going to be moving around with an energy and they will be statistically randomly hitting the sides of this cylinder okay, and implying a force. And the way we think about this is because there would be so many trillions and billions of molecules in here, we, we do a statistical model, really. So we're looking at averages. And that'll make a bit more sense when we start looking at the, at the equation. So we're using an ideal gas. And so this ideal gas law um, comes from this sort of statistical modeling. And we're basically saying that the pressure times the volume is equal to the molar number, which is just an account, how many molecules there are, multiplied by a constant value and multiplied by the temperature in Kelvin. Now, what we should recall is that this exact, this is for chemistry, really, right? Because we're dealing with moles. If we're in physics, we want to know the exact number of molecules, not just a molar number. So we use the same thing, pressure times volume, uh, but actually now we can we can go n to capital N, and this would now be the number of molecules, not just the number of moles, the number of molecules, and now we're going to use a different constant. So rather than using R, we use Boltzmann's constant, okay? Um, and indeed, Boltzmann was the, the grandfather of statistical modeling with, uh, with this type of idea. So what we're seeing here is that we can talk about the pressure, the volume, and the temperature, and the number of molecules in a sort of proportional way. The other thing to note, and it's on our data sheet here, is that pressure is force over area. So of course we can carry this on and say that force over area times volume is N K B T. Okay, and what's really cool is that uh, volume is, well, let's do this over here. Well, maybe we'll make some space just over underneath. Uh, volume is length times width times height, or what would probably be better in terms of a cylinder, the volume is going to be length times the area of this circle here. So it might be better to say that, let's get rid of this, it might be better to say that the volume of this cylinder is length times A. And um, that means we can put this in instead of volume. So let's go ahead and do that as well. So just moving this down here, we're going to say that the force multiplied by the volume, but now the volume is length times area. Okay divided by the area, all of that is now equal to n k b t. And so you can see there that the areas cancel out. So what we're left with is that the force acting on the exterior walls, or the it pushing on the exterior walls of a container, and that would be, of course, in our example, these black arrows pushing out. This would be the the impact or the force that these molecules would exert on the cylinder as they're bouncing around, that force is going to be equal to, um, let's see, it's going to be equal to NKBT 
divided by L. Yeah, that's kind of weird. So because we've cancelled out the areas, there is no, um, there's no force per area, so to speak, because we cancelled it out as part of our ideal gas law. So this force is kind of a, you can kind of think of it as an average in all directions. There is no um, area value there. It's been cancelled out. So our answer here is going to be D. All right, so for question 13, we have a harmonic standing wave being formed on a vertical string that is three meters long. Um, we are told that it has boundary conditions whereby it is fixed at one end and free at the other. So we're dealing with waves and we're dealing with um, wavelengths. So let's think about what we have on our data sheet. Um, we're going to just keep this handy just down in the bottom right corner. So what's going on in this question? All right, we have a first harmonic standing wave being formed by this uh, vibrating source. And it's through this, this string here is three meters long. Okay, and it's going to vibrate such that we have a fixed, uh, a fixed end right here at the top. And then at the other end, it's going to be free. So in other words, we would represent this as a node and an antinode. So let's draw this in, in a bit, uh, a bit bigger. So here's my, my node right at the, the beginning. I'm going to just draw a dotted line down the middle just to give me a reference point. Okay, so here we go. Out it comes. This is going to be an antinode. And I could give myself some reference points here to here. This length here would be equal to my first harmonic or my fundamental frequency. Okay, so this is my first harmonic or fundamental. Okay, we could keep going with our wavelength. Uh, we could get back to here. Okay, this would be, so be back to another node. This would represent half a wavelength, right? Because a wavelength has to go from, has to complete a full cycle. So it's going to come up, back to normal, and then it has to go down and back to normal again to create a full wavelength. So let's keep going just for fun. So here we go, round. And at this point, we get back to another anti-node. And then if I can just move this out the way, let's put it over here. Um, I can keep going. Let's put in my reference lines right here, and right here. I'm going to keep going to get my full wavelength all the way down to here. Okay, so this is now a full wavelength and it's not to scale for sure. But there we go. So the wavelength has done a full cycle. It's gone. If we just pick one side of this, it goes up, back to normal, down, back to the reference point. So this would be a full wavelength. And so <clears throat> this, this situation, this situation here is giving us our, this is our first harmonic. Okay, so in other words, this section in here is three meters. Okay, so how long is the wavelength? Well, three times three, sorry, three plus three plus three plus three. So a wavelength is going to be 12 meters. Okay, so we know our wavelength, we know our frequency, and we're asked to find the speed of the wave on the string. Well, hopefully you can see down here our universal wave equation, which in this case would not be C, because that's the speed of light, but just our universal wave equation in other words, V of the wave, is lambda frequency. In other words, the wavelength times the frequency. So now it's pretty straightforward. We're going to go 12 meters multiplied by the frequency, which is 300 hertz. And so that gives us a speed of 3,600 meters per second, or in other words, a speed of 3.6 kilometers per second. So our answer is D.